good morning, everyone. Finally, it is this day. I've been so ex wildly excited about the day since January when I came here to Hanna Holmen and said that we have this great idea, do you have any dates left? And they were immediately on board and they were like, we have these two days, will you take it? And I'm, I was like, yes, I so will. And after that, it's been like everything has been falling into its place. And I am so happy that you, all my colleagues, are here today and that we got such a marvelous audience for these days. So this is great. So in the next coming hour, <laughs> we aim to take you through the convention. Thank you, Suzanne, so much for helping us out. I think you really took quite a lot of pressure out of our shoulders. So we can just sort of complete here and complement the picture of what we think in the Nordic countries and how we have seen the convention. So my name is Lena Marsio and I work as a senior advisor in Museo Virasto Musei Verket, the Finnish Heritage Agency. And this has been my dream job for the past five years now. I want to thank also on my own behalf all of the partners for making today possible and especially my, my colleagues in the Finnish Heritage Agency here in Hanna Holmen and then Arts Promotion Center. There has been a really a lot of work done so that you all and we all can be here today. It's the first time ever we have this kind of big Nordic and also Baltic conference around intangible cultural heritage. So I also hope that maybe we can make this a tradition and there will be follow up afterwards after this one. Uh, and just to mention here that these, all these videos of the presentation and then also the PowerPoint slides will be made available online later for you. Uh, maybe here in between I will just, uh, we will make a round with the microphone so that everyone says who we are and then we'll go on. But maybe you, Kirstina, can start and take one of the mics from there. I am Christina Müller. I come from the Greenland National Museum and Archives. I am Annika Färberg. I'm the Swedish coordinator, and I come from the Institute for Language and Folklore in Sweden. My name is Hildegun Björgen, and I'm from the Arts Council, Norway. Yes, and my name is Staffan Bejar. I work as an ethnologist for the government of Åland, mostly as a curator for Orlands Museum. Uh, my name is Tota Otnogatir and I'm from the Faroe Islands. I work at the University of the Faroe Islands uh, in, as an assistant professor of oral tradition. Yes, uh, I'm Runar Leifsson. I come from Iceland. Uh, I work at the Ministry of Education, Science and Culture, where I'm an uh, advisor in the Office of Culture. And my name is Maria Lang, and I'm the Danish coordinator. I come from the Royal Danish Library. And in the next coming hour, we'll have quite an ambitious task. Let's see how we deal with it. But we try to keep our spirits up and to share our own views on what's been happening in the convention and what we think about it. And here you see can see, can see the structure of our presentation. But before that, we have an audience participation part. So go and take your mobile phones. Everyone, take your mobile phone. I don't know if any of the colleagues, I hope some of you do. So grab your phone. Oh, yes. And go to www.menti.com. We are going to ask you a question on who you are. And uh, yes, let's take it from there. Yeah. So okay. www.menti.com. And when you go to the website, it will ask you a code and then type 3936 and 44. And the question is, what kind of living heritage do you mainly associate with? So if you work with crafts or dance or nature or policies or archives, you may want to type that in. Or if you have several options, you can type something that you really feel like the hat you are wearing today. 
And as we see, now a wonderful word cloud is starting to come up. <laughs> and we see who we are in the room. And the more there is, for example, I see music in the middle. We see that there are quite many people in the room who are working for music. A lot in crafts and nature, dance, art. And the more and more it gets, we see it's now 63 people getting into 70 there in the corner. I don't know if, well, some of you see it. So it's going to be a very nice cloud of things, and it's getting smaller and smaller. But hey, <laughs> Sophia, you take a picture before we okay. close this one, so we can save it and maybe share it somewhere, for example, at our own uh, website, Facebook. So what we all are. But here, really, we see the diversity of the participants still coming up. Okay, it's growing bigger and bigger, but we will now move on to the next question, which is then like a more kind of an organizational question. What kind of an organization do you represent? What is your affiliation? So if you are wearing today the hat of a practitioner, non-governmental organization or association, museum, archive, educational institution, government, or then something else. So we see, and I bet we are all happy, and especially Suzanne, to see that it is already most of the participants come from NGOs. <laughs> so this is nice. So this is who we are in the room. And while it grows there and we can then uh, save and share the, the rest of it, we will now go forward with our presentation. So we are going to start uh, this morning with the convention, and as we are a bit of pressure on time, and Suzanne already qu covered quite much of it, but I would just like to summarize maybe here uh, in the start that um, for us here in the Nordic countries, what a marvelous tool this is that we can work with. I am always so proud to say that it's 178 state parties, countries that are part of this convention. And, and I have colleagues doing this kind of a work in 177 countries. At the moment, it's only 19 countries who are not part of this convention. And it's really so many states that have said that safeguarding living heritage is important. They have put under their name on the convention and wanted to work for it. Um, I think also that, the, thank you, Suzanne, for your kind words to, to, to all of the Nordic countries, that, that you also believe in us in the UNESCO and, and maybe some other countries too, but regarding the spirit of the convention, which I hope you will, you will feel <laughs> during these one, two or three days that you are here, I think it's maybe easy, easy somehow here in the Nordic countries to implement. We are such, we are not very hierarchical, we are flat. We know each other, we are rather small countries. And so I think this makes it easier for us to, to work on the grassroots level. And uh, as mentioned, it is the sister convention to World Heritage. And I think we also somehow benefit it from it, at least the more that I've been starting to use the UNESCO word. And we are also going for forward with the inventorying and even with the UNESCO nominations. It's really see that we are working with the really back big brand that is known all over the world and, and by people in our countries. Regarding the next slides, I'm not going to go more into the, the definitions, but maybe here to highlight the first Nordic, pan-Nordic nomination that we are working uh, at the moment. It's the Nordic Linkebo traditions. Maybe Tura, you can stand up and show, show your face, so I'm going to do a bit of easing of the, the networking here in this session as well. But now we're going to go forward and, and Annika, my good colleague from Sweden, can take the microphone and yeah. you could tell us a bit of what's 
what's been happening in Sweden. Yeah, hello everybody. <laughs> it's very nice to be here. And uh, I will say thank you for Lena for letting me come here. And thank you also for Hanna Holmen. It's very beautiful. And I woke up this morning and I saw the sea. <laughs> yeah, it was very beautiful. So I have a few minutes to speak. And in these minutes, I will try to grasp eight years with the convention in Sweden. So I, I will start now. Sweden ratified the convention in January 2011, so it's been eight years since the ratification. And since then, the Institute for Language and Folklore, in which I will refer to as ISOF, has an assignment from the Swedish government to be the coordinating state agency responsible for the work with the convention in Sweden. And since the start, we have been working a lot to form organizations which is called NUDS, and I heard it, it has been an inspiration for Finland. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, and uh, secondly, uh, we, we moved to October and September 2015, uh, when the Swedish inventory, Levande Traditioner, Living Traditions, was launched. And this is a living document which, which is constantly updated. It's also connected to a database which preserves all incoming submissions. And this is very important, I think, because no, not all the submissions comes to the inventory, mm. according to the opera, operational directives. <laughs> The Institute for Language and Folklore has the overall responsibility for this, and the work is carried out in collaboration with primarily the nodes, and but also with different communities and NGOs. And number three, we move to 2016, where the last report, we have had several reports to the Swedish government, from 2012 till 2016, the last report. And it's about the national work on the application of the ICH convention. And this is a report about the, how the work with the convention had progressed in Sweden. It also contains proposals about how the work can evolve in the future. For instance, it underlines the cooperation with the national minorities and the, that the Nordic cooperation should be further developed. So we have had a long uh, experience of Nordic cooperation now. <laughs> um, we also had an, another report, the periodic reporting during 2017, and it was the old one, so it was very heavy. Yeah. <laughs> Required a lot of effort. <laughs> yeah. Mm. And fourth, in May 2017, the Sp Swedish Parliament passed the Cultural Heritage Bill, Kulturarvspolitik, where the Swedish government took a holistic approach to the cultural heritage sphere and making it, and this is the first time, a separate policy field. One article is devoted to the uh, work with the ICH convention. And it aims to make a broader concept of what cultural heritage is, and especially intangible cultural heritage. Through the bill, a new grant was established for non-governmental actors, NGOs, and cultural projects with the aim to stimulate participation in cultural heritage work. It's now established and administrated by the National Heritage Board. And then I move to next point, number five, uh, which is this year, because in, during spring this year, 
we, have, we got a new assignment from the Swedish government, and it's about proposals to the international lists. Yeah. And we have been really restrictive with this point in Sweden so far. But now I think we're moving ahead. Yeah. <laughs> and with this proposal, ISOF underlines that Sweden will continue to be strict. But at the same point, it's important to see that international nominations could increase the interest in the national inventory and also in the overall work with the convention. Uh, this was the case when the storytelling network of Kronoberg, also Brettanete Kronoberg, was included in the Register of Good Safing pr pr uh, Safeguarding Practices in 2018, when several new proposals came into the national inventory in Sweden. And the last point, uh, which I don't know so much yet, uh, it's about Sw Sweden's, Sweden is about to candidate to the committee. And we'll see what becomes of this in June 2020. So even if we already had done a lot of work, the show must go on. Uh, it's the work that constantly changing, new goals and challenges show up for the future work. And do I have some minutes left? Yeah, I don't know if the next slide comes up. Yeah, that's good. So here you can see one, some of them. Um, it's about to spread information about the convention, and it's very important, and especially to the NGOs, to develop broader involvement with representatives of the national minorities, as I said before, give NGOs and practitioners possibility to participate in networks and meetings about money, of course. Uh, establish new goals and adjust the organization as the work goes on. Um, and the international nominations, which, which has a great interest in Sweden amongst the NGOs, uh, to further develop the international cooperation and the Nordic especially and the committee membership if voted for. Thank you. <laughs> We're going to be quite many in the row so maybe you can applaud then in, in the end but I'm going to pass it now to, to my dear colleague Hildekun from Norway and, and you can continue and tell a bit how does it look like from your perspective? Yes, thank you, Lena. And I would also say thank you for inviting us, of course. Uh, and also thank you to Susanna, because you, you told a lot of what I have actually <laughs> written here. So I can just skip a lot of the things that I, had, uh, that I thought I should say. But Norway has a large and vibrant voluntary sector, as you said, in all the Nordic countries have. We have a strong civil sector, which has been developed as a consequence of cultural policy, focusing on democratic involvement. And this is in the spirit of the convention. So the NGOs in Norway are really important in the work with the implementation, and they are doing a really good job. Uh, they are, they are giving us feedbacks on when we don't do things that they th uh, thought we should do or, or have some suggestion that this could be better than that and so on. So we do have a good dialogue with the NGOs, especially with the accredited NGOs. And in Norway, there are seven accredited NGOs, and as uh, Susanna's uh, slides shows. And I wonder how many accredited NGOs are in the um, audience here today? Could you raise your hand? Raise your hand and even stand up so people yeah. see. So if you want to hear more details about Akrid Avind also, you please stand up. So these are the experts who've been really... From the Nordic countries. From yeah. the Nordic countries who really know the convention and everything related to it. So over the lunch, mm. go and mm. grasp some of their hands. So Yeah. Uh, I would like to say that the accredited NGOs is doing a very good job, but also the 
other NGOs in Norway that are into the work with the ICH. They are, they are really important in this work, and we encourage them to, to uh, uh, talk to the accredited NGOs to actually uh, get more information about the convention and how to work for themselves. What's in it for me is the crucial question here. What's in it for my uh, community? What's in it for my NGO? So how can I work to, to actually broaden out the spirit of the convention? And then I would like to go to the focus on the indigenous people and the national minorities. And it was good to see that the Swedish uh, uh, work with this are going to focus on the national minorities in the future because Norway has been working uh, especially with the with the Sami groups, uh, or uh, uh, when when we implemented the con uh, when Norway ratified the convention, it was says that the Arts Council should actually concentrate on the work with the indigenous people and national minorities and their intangible cultural heritage, in accordance with the national politics on the field, and in political document this has been repeated. We have to work further on. It's not completed, not at all. So Arts Council has therefore organized seminars on ICH with representatives from different Sami institutions and organizations back in 2013. And after that, we have been collaborating with the Sami parliament, really closely collaborating with the Sami parliament, and especially the two last years. Uh, we have been, uh, we have been um, uh, launching seminars together, and actually we are going to have a workshop on capacity building with uh, UNESCO consulates in two weeks in Karashok. It's a pan-Sami workshop uh, on Sami ICH. And I also want to highlight that the NGOs, especially the accredited NGOs, but also other NGOs, have been working more and more with the Sami and the national minorities. And that is really amazing to see how you actually broaden out the perspective of, of uh, intangible cultural heritage in the field there. So, so this is really, really important. Yes, thank you. Uh, I would also like to remind that then on Friday afternoon there is a workshop on living heritage, cultural diversity, and indigenous peoples, which will, which will then discuss this more deeply. But then we will turn into the next part, the, the convention for the safeguarding. It's a key concept in the convention, but what does it actually mean? I can honestly admit that it took me two or three years to really see what it is about. And so it's not a very easy one, but it's a very central one. You, Susan, already touched upon it, but, that, but what about Hildekun? Yeah, uh, as Susanna said, uh, safeguarding means ensuring the ICH viability for today's generation and also for the next generation. And community and groups of practitioners and other tradition bearers all over the world, uh, they have developed their own system, their own methods for transmitting the knowledge and skills. So I would like to talk about what could we do in the national level here. And as Susanne pointed out, as a in, as in the international level, we talk about uh, communities and groups. They must be involved. That is crucial. And that's what uh, Annika has said. That's uh, what we are going to s talk about the whole uh, seminar, I guess, the whole conference, is how uh, important it is to, to actually uh, involve the, the communities. But what we have been doing in Norway and in the Nordic countries is also we have been focusing on awareness raising. We have had conferences, seminars, workshops, the organized by the Arts Council, organized by others, and organized by the NGOs, where they invite us to talk about the, uh, how we work with the Convention. You can also work on list and register on a national level, of course, and that leads to an overview and also uh, to actually for the communities to, to talk about their work, to, to, to describe their work in, an, in another way that they usually be, uh, used to be. So it, it, is, uh, it is really important for safeguarding to actually talk about it in, in the UNESCO way, to, to do understand how the mechanisms uh, uh, are, are cooperating or are uh, talking to each other. Uh, there is also important to uh, highlight the educational programs knowledge building, both uh, formal and non-formal knowledge. So, uh, and I think uh, for, uh, Greenland and, uh, and the Faroe Island is going to talk about uh, uh, education building. So 
we, we also talk about legislation. How, how does the national acts or, or laws actually correspond with, with the, with the um, uh, convention? And as an example, I, I, took, uh, I looked at the Norwegian Arts Council Act, Kulturrådsloven, uh, and uh, the purpose of Arts Council Norway is to stimulate today's diverse art and cultural expressions <coughs> and to contribute to the creation, preservation, documentation, and making art and culture available to as many people as possible. So it is in uh, line with the, with the convention. I also think it's important to actually look at other conventions, like the ILO Convention, Indigenous and Tribal Convention from 1989. Norway ratified it in 1990. How can we fit these two conventions together and also other ratified convention and charters that re regulates the uh, relationship between national minorities in Norway and the state party? So it's important to actually look at these things. And also financial in incentives, worldwide, as Susanne pointed out, but also in, in the countries. And Arts Council's uh, role is in particular is that we receive some 20,000 applications for funding in Arts Council every year. And uh, this it was back in 2018. But we do, uh, we do handle around 140 million euro in state funds to earmark for arts and culture, which is approximately 10% of the national bu uh, cultural budget. And Arts Council Norway provide funding for a variety of projects and activities within performance, uh, performing arts, visual arts, music, theater, and so on. So safeguarding is important. And I want to highlight just the last words here, the networking. This conference that actually focuses on ICH is one thing, and we are into many networks, different networks in the Arts Council. Um, we, we are into this Östersjösamarbeidet, the Baltic Region Heritage Committee, and how can ICH be transmitted into this, uh, or, or focused in this um, network? Uh, we also are in the network of European cultural roots. How could we bring I ICH and the ICH focus in these networks? Uh, we're talking about sustainable tourism. We talk about sustainable uh, local societies and so on. And also I attended to the, uh, in the Arctic Arts Summit conference and, and the Arctic Arts Summit uh, network. The Arctic... Um, Last, uh, last summer, and uh, the Arctic area is, is changing. And how could we actually work with the ICH and especially the indigenous peoples uh, ICH in this context? How can we highlight ICH in, in the Arctic Arts Summit network? And how could we actually highlight uh, ICH in the inclusive cultural sector in the Nordic country th countries? That's a project in between all the Nordic countries. And also we have to highlight the different networks that the NGOs are sitting in, how to highlight ICH here. So mm. that was my last lead. Thank you, Hildegun. I'm really glad that you can open up, open up here how much the convention actually touches upon so many issues and so many sectors in our societies. And I will now hand over to, to our colleague Kirstine from Greenland. Yes, first I would like to thank you for having me here. It's an exciting pro program and it's really interesting and exciting for me to be with so many colleagues from the Nordic countries. In Greenland, I am the only one <laughs> responsible for implementing the con convention. So it is amazing to be with colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> we, s we so know the feeling, we feel it every time. <laughs> Now, I've brought with me some, um, some case studies from Greenland. I've not listed all of them, just um, to keep us within the time limit. On a national level, uh, we, are we are organized a bit differently from the rest of the Nordic countries. We don't really have any NGOs, but we do have lots of associations working with ICH. <laughs> okay, it's, so it's a language thing. <laughs> So, um, on a national level, for instance, the first one, Rangnamuk Unamursuang Nok, is the Kayak Championships, which are an annual event 
where all the kayak associations in Greenland gather together to compete, of course, but also to share knowledge about kayaks, because they differ vastly from within Greenland, even though we are only 58,000 people. It's divided into age groups, and it's amazing to follow them every year, because they move around from city to city to settlement, and share all these different ways of building both the old kayaks, experimenting with new forms of kayaks, and even with new forms of materials. The second one I have is the Galaxy Sulyong Nong Nik Ilinyaktik, is a state organized school for the national um, dress. We have six different national dresses, so depending on where you are from, th that is the one that the sewers can, um, what's it called? Uh, I can't even remember the Danish word. <laughs> 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 uh, they can specialize in it. And they have been working with different ways of reinventing but still keeping the dress um, more or less the same. We now are working with computer applications to work on the beading. We have different forms of, of um, application, even on the phone, to work on the different um, kinds of embroideries, the skin embroideries and mechanics. And it's been amazing to see how making a school funded by the government can help safeguarding um, the national dress, even if it is not in any danger of disappearing. Now, um, I come from a museum, and one of the projects that we have had is, which is also on a national level, but I have decided to put it in within the museum realm, is the Oyagi Sangnok Adasisut cultural bearers. And we've been working a lot with this at my museum, <coughs> choosing cultural bearers and then having a three year period where we focus on their uh, speciality. So it's been drum dancing for a long period. Now we are discussing what other subject to pick up. And it's really difficult because since we are working within these long time ranges, how do we decide and how do the communities get to decide on how, on which cultural bearers to choose next? Um, so we right now in a really interesting process of choosing a new area to focus on. The drum dancing um, and singing is a pan Inuit tradition, and we are actually have uh, worked on a, an application for the uh, for one of the lists at UNESCO, which will be sent next year. And then the last one that I would like to highlight is the Opal Settlement, uh, organized by Kaisil Yangwit Museum in North Greenland, where they focus on the different ways of living before 1950. So they're trying to, and with success, safeguarding the old ways of cooking, of sewing, of living without electricity, and they do it every summer, and it's a real pleasure to actually visit these places. That was my Okay, input. thank you. I mean, it's actually quite practical things that are then related to safeguarding in practice. That is why we have also built then the workshops on safeguarding. Tomorrow, af as, uh, tomorrow afternoon, there is a workshop on crafts, on oral heritage, on performing arts, and also nature. So all craftspeople, for example, can come together and discuss what it actually mean in, means in their field. But now I will hand over to Åland, to Staffan Beyer, and you could share, share a bit of your ideas on safeguarding traditional wooden boats, is it? Yes, I will. I will start by congratulating Tore. Your campaign has worked. I have only one slide, it's the clinker boats. <laughs> the Nordic nomination. I won't speak about that though, we have an expert in the audience. I will start by explaining the Åland situation because Åland is a province in Finland, it's an autonomy and it has been internationally decided that the Åland government should have the legislative power over some issues. One of them is culture and the cultural heritage. 
So that's why we are working sort of in parallel with Lena. And um, we work with an inventory. We will soon launch it. It hasn't been launched yet. Though uh, the internet address is in the brochure, so if you'd like to see, <coughs> see it, you can be the first ones to do it. We have only one entry there. That's the clinker boards. <laughs> I like this picture very much. I've taken it myself <laughs> last week. And it's showing the entry room of the cultural museum in Orland. It's actually not real water there. We have only one object there, and that is this traditional clinker boat. And then we have projections showing nature. And we have decided this boat because it's very important for Orland and has been. Orland is a small community. There's about 30,000 inhabitants. There are more than 6,000 islands. So boats have been enormously important and still are. We work when it comes to culture and safeguarding mostly with financing NGOs. We have a small administration. We don't do so many big projects. We have many NGOs and up till this day we also have a lot of money. We have a fund that comes from the gaming industry that gives money to NGOs that are working with uh, the environment, with social issues, with culture. Uh, the last number I remember, uh, the fund gave about 1.2 million euros for culture. Then there are some private funds, for example, Svenska Kulturfonden gives to Åland and Åboland, the region of around Turku, around seven, uh, 700,000 a year. So if about half of it comes to Åland, you have 1.5 million euro for 30,000 people. And by doing this, it's the community themselves that decide how they are working with their intangible cultural heritage. From a governmental level, we ain't deciding exactly how they should work. We are reading their applications, and if it seems fine, they receive some money. What we do do is, for example, as in this picture, we do help by giving uh, uh, giving an open space to show these kind of different traditions that we do in the museum. We also work, we help these NGOs. Um, for example, there is one association now, they are building a huge clinker boat and they are documenting this project, how they are doing it. They uh, have uh, taken help of some master builders, they have an apprenticeship system, and they are filming this, they are photographing it, they are documenting it in different areas. Me, I work with documentation for the museum. I ain't doing this documentation. They are doing it themselves, but I'm advising them. They come to the government asking, how can we do this the best way? And I have told them, okay, this is the way we work, and they'd like to, uh, to give this final material to the archives, and I explained to them, okay, we'd like to take it, but we can only archive this, this if it follows these and these standards. So in that way, we are we are helping these NGOs. Okay, thank you, Staffan. Now, for the sake of time, we're gonna go a bit faster. I'm gonna ask my Hildi co colleagues 
Hildegun and Annika to speed up to cut down what they were about to say, that there is time left for the other colleagues. But we are now going to move into the communities in the heart of the convention. And Hildegun, you would like to say something about it? I was asked to say something about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Susanna said a lot about the communities. And I, do, I don't want to repeat what she said. But one thing we actually could say is that the convention is not defining communities. It's not defining the convention. So um, according to, uh, or for, uh, for the purpose of the implementation of the convention, state parties define communities according to various criteria, such as administrative, geographically, occupational, religious or ethno-linguistic criteria. And communities and groups often define themselves in relation to a specific ICH element or to a group of such elements. And as Susanna said, they, they are not homogeneous. And, they are, uh, and within the community, there might be different opinions about matter related to identification uh, and safeguarding, of course. So this was what I... And I can't help mm. taking a practical example. I actually like this picture really a lot. It's from the UNESCO capacity building materials. If we take as an example, sauna culture in Finland, which is our first file to UNESCO, we have, if we are 5.5, we have maybe 5.4 million people who go to the sauna. So there in the center, we have all the people who go to the sauna once a week, once a month, even once a year or once a day. But then on the second round, uh, identified communities or those associated with identified ICH, they can be different kind of actors. They can be those who maybe publish a magazine about sauna, they make the stoves or they build up saunas. And then in the last round, it's all the Finnish people who have some kind of a relationship to the sauna anyhow, even if the, they, they wouldn't like it. So it's a really huge concept that one needs to discuss here. But maybe, Annika, some words about how you work with the communities yeah. in Sweden. OK. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Um, yeah. Um, we, we tried at an early age, I can say, at stage uh, before, really before we ratified the convention, we were thinking about how to involve the NGOs and practic practitioners in, in they work with the convention in Sweden. So we we set up a, a sort of map of how how to spread out the work with the convention, uh, and we develop this organization, which includes this uh, central uh, coordinating authority, ISOF, which, which I come from, and four nodes responsible for different domains of the convention. And we can see a schedule over this here. So we see the expert nodes are the Nordic Museum, which together with ISOF is, uh, uh, has the oral traditions and expressions. The National Swedish Handicraft is responsible for traditional craftsmanship and we have a lot of lot to do with them, I can say, because uh, traditional <coughs> craftsmanship is a dominating area in the convention <coughs> and in the work with the, the inventory. We have Musikverket, Swedish Performance Age Arts I Agency, is responsible for, for performances in music, dance, theater, and so on. And we have the National Heritage Board, which is, is responsible for knowledge and customs concerning nature. Uh, and maybe we have this other picture we can see. And besides the nodes, there is a lot of networks uh, that are created with practitioners, representatives from is institutions of research and education, cultural heritage institutions, and non-governmental organizations. Um, for instance, the Sami parliament um, in initially formed a special Sami working group 
and, and um, this was very successful in the beginning, but uh, I must say we have not had as much collaboration with the, the Stamis in, in Sweden, mm. unfortunately. We hope to evolve that in the future. Uh, and besides from the news, there is also a working group with actors from different organizations connected to the work with the convention. All the nodes are represented as well as some of the NGOs and together with the Sami parliament in Sweden. The group has been co coordinated since 2011 and there have been seven, several meetings. And last, the next goal is to create a reference group connected to the coming work with the international nominations. But as I said before, we are still waiting for an answer from the Swedish government. Okay. And maybe just here the mention, I mean, we, we really liked your idea of the notes and when we were planning for the implementation here in Finland, we established the mm. circles of living heritage. Maybe those people that have been somehow part in the Eleven Perin and Ring, it can, can raise your hand who have been involved in this work. So maybe like 10 people or something. So nice to see you all here. Mm -hmm. But basically, I mean, the convention is something that we need to work with the communities who are practicing this heritage. And I think as, as also Juhani here mentioned in his speech, we are trying to find different kind of ways, ways of how to reach out and how to do better work together. But for example, in Finland, we've been doing seminar events, publications, exhibitions. Actually, two of our web publications are upstairs on the table. One of them, Elossa, related to nature and living heritage, and then Käsi Työn äärellä, about crafts. So those are both online publications. But they are really important. It's, it's great to sit down at least twice a year to have a cup of coffee and a good bun and to discuss what is happening in the convention and what is happening with all of, all of them. Because I think the challenge for us quite often is that all of the practitioners, I could say all of the NGO uh, associations were there before the convention. So our challenge actually has been that we came in late and we're like, hey, we have this convention from UNESCO and we know how to solve your issues now. So we need to find ways on how to reach out to you and how to work together and use these marvelous tools that have been, has, has been invented by tens and tens of states and experts and NGOs all over the world and bring this knowledge to you. And I guess this is, this is the idea with the circles. Annika, do you want to say something really quickly on a general level on the inventorying before I give the word to... You could say something, maybe. You don't mind if I skip this one and let you speak like three minutes about your inventory. I mean, you were the first ones in Sweden to have a national something. inventory and we yeah. others follow. Uh, we launched the inventory in 2014. No, we... The guidelines were drawn up 2014, and we launched it in September 2015. Uh, and since then, there, there are continuously co incoming suggestions to the inventory. And we have now about 50 suggestions, I think, about. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of suggestions that we haven't had time yet to, to figure out how to manage them. How many minutes do I have? <laughs> well, if I can choose, I will. <laughs> you will cut me now. <laughs> I'll cut you now, dear. You you can then complain me afterwards. Yeah. Okay. Let's. Thanks a lot for this. And <laughs> I will say very quickly that in Finland we have the wiki inventory. It's on a me media wiki basis, and it's open and it's instant. Anyone can go with their NGO or community or a group of people and write in their article, and we go and see afterwards what it is about. Of course, we do administration and we do editing, but it's, it's been a real success. So we have 150 examples from over 220 communities. It works in three different languages, Finnish, Swedish, English, but it's also possible to contribute in other languages. So we also have Northern Sami <coughs> and then the Finnish Roma language as one of the, of the 
languages. In addition to the Wiki inventory, we have a national inventory. It's actually opening up for the second round next Monday, closing on 5th of December. So now we have 52 elements on the national inventory. And from there, it's possible then to go forward and, and uh, strive for uh, a nomination in the UNESCO list. But I will now give the floor to my colleague Maria Lang, and, and so you could tell a bit how you've been working in Denmark with your inventory. Yes. Thank you very much, Lena. And thank you for making this conference happen. It's so interesting to be here. Um, in Denmark, we first started inventorying in 2017, and we adapted the Finnish way with the low threshold wiki approach where individuals and groups can contribute simply by logging on to a website. And our role at the um, Danish library, the Royal Danish Library, uh, was limited to that of an editor, making sure the examples were in line with the principles of the convention and um, making smaller changes, such as improving the layout, stuff like that. So the idea has been to generate a 100% user-generated uh, wiki inventory, thus highlighting the knowledge of the sender and bringing their understanding of ICH, Intangible Cultural Heritage, to the fore, which is very much in the spirit of the convention to bring the communities in center. Uh, so we facilitated the wiki and people provided the content and after this first round, uh, we need to evaluate and discuss if this approach accommodates the purpose of the inventory, which is to safeguard ICH. We received uh, 47 contributions, and some were written in an afternoon. Others were the outcome of long and sometimes very heated debates among the communities. So the contributions varied greatly. And it leaves us with the question, where does the safeguarding actually occur during this inventory process? Is it in the writing process? Is it in the dissemination of the wiki to the public? Is it in the documentation? Because we keep all the contributions in the archive at the library. Um, what I have seen so far is that the safeguarding very much takes place in the writing process when people sit down and discuss what they do, why they do it, and how it can be passed on, thoughts start emerging, and, and people become aware of what they do is actually intangible cultural heritage, and um, what might be important to somebody in the group is not the same that is important to other people in the group, so these discussions and thoughts arise. Um, my idea is that perhaps we should be a little bit more involved in the context production, perhaps facilitate workshops, uh, encourage collaborations among the NGOs to get together uh, when they write their example of intangible cultural heritage. And um, so we can generate um, a lot of dialogue and make this writing process to the inventory um, a safeguarding activity. That was my few minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, when we started to think about how to implement the convention and, and how to inventory or, or, or list intangible heritage in Iceland, uh, we realized that we needed our starting point uh, uh, of reference. We cannot start blindingly by collecting things. Uh, and this means, uh, uh, and it is stated in the convention, that you, 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 you need to start by identifying and defining various elements of, of intangible cultural heritage. We tried to do this in Iceland. Uh, and we needed to do this with the participation of stakeholders, uh, groups, individuals engaged with uh, intangible heritage. And on top of that, of course, we needed to uh, um, introduce the 2002 convention to the public and to interested stakeholders as well. Uh, in order for the convention to be actively, actively used, you know, people need to be aware of its existence and, and this need, needs to be raised. So to start off, and this was in probably 2015 thereabouts, 
this before my time in ministry, a long time before I got there. Uh, so and, and, in, and in order to sort of get the lay of the land, if you like, around Iceland, to reach potential stakeholders and, and to sort of map the various elements of, of intangible cultural heritage that were present, uh, the Ministry of Culture hired, hired a company, it's not an NGO, it's an actual company, it's called Theolist. Uh, this is engaged with intangible cultural heritage. Uh, Theolist works with grassroots and, and promotes traditional music, poetry, traditional dances, and so on. Uh, but the company was hired to work on, on a data gathering project, essentially, based on Articles 2 and 11 of, of the 2003 Convention. And they worked for about 21 months, or thereabouts, mapping Iceland. And this essentially resulted in 70 meetings around the country, uh, open meetings. Uh, and they were aimed at promoting the Convention in that uh, raising awareness uh, and in that getting into contact and, and, and getting to know about the relevant stakeholders. And, and these meetings, I mean, they were in, as I say, 17 different locations, some were quite rural. They tried to visit some of the major small towns and, and ran one big meeting in Reykjavik. And they were quite well advertised. They were ad ad advertised on social media, uh, in local printed media, printed press, and they were advertised with posters in local shops and so on. Uh, this work then resulted in a report for the Ministry of Culture in the beginning of 2017, uh, where we now have a sort of rudimentary list, if you like, of, of, of relevant parties working with intangible cultural heritage. Uh, and we had many ideas from this based on the views and what, what people want in regard to the, the heritage they're safekeeping. Uh, and you know, as we found out, as it turns out, you know, people, some people are a bit shy of words like intangible heritage or words like UNESCO even. Uh, people do not want to have their living heritage institutionalized, for example, uh, or standardized. That's, a, that's one of the major things. It's supposed to be a living thing, an organic thing within communities. Uh, this can have different flavors depending on which community you look at and so on. Uh, so these were very good conversations to have right at the start. And then, sort of based on this work of mapping, it was decided uh, the best way to, to proceed with the formal inventory was, was to keep it as much with the grassroots and with the people engaged with heritage as possible. Uh, and the Ministry of Culture, of course, looked towards our neighboring countries, what was going on there, uh, looked look for ins inspiration, and we decided on, 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 on inventorying through a website uh, where interested stakeholders uh, can themselves uh, upload descriptions of their intangible uh, cultural heritage. Uh, the ministry allocated this project to uh, a very capable institute, the Orde Magnusson Institute for Icelandic Studies, which is connected to the, uni the University of Iceland. Uh, the institute then hired a person uh, responsible for, for working on the website, for promoting uh, uh, for its content and uploading it. Uh, and she's here, Wilhelmina, so it's a very capable person. And the website is called Levante Hevdir, as you can see up there, uh, .is. And this was launched in December of 2018, so it's just under 11 months ago. Uh, and this event, the launching of the website, it was quite noticeable. Uh, uh, it made the news even, and, and, and it got some exposure. And, and I believe the project is going quite well. We, are, we have been getting steady additions to the inventory. Uh, this has been a learning curve, of course, over the past months. Uh, I think a lot of work goes into discussing things with individuals, yeah, sorry, discussing things with individual stakeholders and, and try to get them engaged. Uh, people are generally happy and, and interested with the project, but you know, it's, it's selling the idea, you know, and, and getting people involved to, to do this themselves and upload themselves onto the website, so. Thank you. Dear colleagues, we have something like eight minutes left. I wish we had another hour, but we don't. But here in between, I'm going to ask how many of the audience have taken part in inventorying in a national level? Have you been writing or managing or editing or something? So I see quite many hands, one fourth, one third even, has been inventorying. What about UNESCO nominations? Have you been applying or planning or something? Maybe you can, well, it is quite many hands, really. Okay, good to know. 
So I'm going to take the lead now, dear colleagues, and say just a few words about international nominations. And I still then leave room for Tota to, to speak what she <laughs> came here to speak about. But just to say about the international lists under UNESCO. So we do have two different lists and one register. And at the moment, it's 508 elements all together from 122 countries. Sorry, this is now very small. I don't know if you see it, but I have here the UNESCO nominations in the Baltic countries. So actually, Estonia, Lithuania, and uh, Latvia were there. One of the first countries in the convention. Maybe I can ask my, my Baltic colleagues to stand up, which of you are coordinating the convention, or something similar. So Anita, Margit, uh, Milda. So these are my colleagues in the countries. And regarding the Baltic nominations, I think we have at least Suiti community. So maybe you stand up. So we will hear your presentation, Mara, then later in, in, the, the, um, in the program. And then from Kihnu, Kihnu Island, we have Mara here, who is very experienced as well. Uh, regarding the Nordic countries, the case is such that, as mentioned, Sweden, Meg, please stand up. So it's the land of legends that is in the register of good safeguarding practices. And then we have the Uuselvar boat. We don't have a boat builder, but we have maybe Avind here, who and Dag, maybe you stand up, who have been involved in these nominations. And we will hear more about this then later in the program. Uh, go ongoing no nominations, we have uh, uh, Nordic Linke boats, then we have uh, sauna culture in Finland, I see Risto somewhere, who's been working, Risto is waving, waving his hand, and then Kaustinen fiddle playing, maybe the Kaustinen team can stand up as well, so, so we will hear more about your examples then in the workshops. Uh, In this, in just a few words about the convention as a tool. I'm always proud to say that people ask me that, Lena, how, how long this project is going to be up and running? And I'm, I'm always proudly saying <laughs> it's a convention that is ratified by the state of Finland. And so I think maybe there were some people who came to the room and was like, hey, where's the list under UNESCO? We are interested in that. So I hope that in this session we've been able to show how much more the convention actually is than just nominating to UNESCO. But uh, for example, education is one of the fields that we are actively working in. And uh, we here in Finland have established a website on Lade uh, Jenna Levan Traditioner. There is a leaflet on, on the board and you can go and have a look in Swedish and in Finnish. But one example of, of education, what you are, you are doing, so we still have Tota left, so from Faroe Islands. So could you please briefly explain? Uh, yes, thank you. <coughs> uh, I would just uh, say on behalf of Armga, who was going to be here, that she was very sad that she couldn't come. Uh, I'm just trying to step in. I got very short notice from yesterday, and I thought I was going to talk about the situation on intangible heritage on the Faroe Islands. Uh, <laughs> but so I will just quite shortly say that um, uh, we passed, we ratified the convention last year, only last year. And um, I think that uh, I, I would just like to depart from that thing about uh, the convention as a tool. Uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, the, the convention was passed in the Faroe Islands. I think it has very much this notion that there is now this really cool new tool which everyone is getting in order to save their heritage. So of course we want the Faroes uh, to, to have this tool because um, we also have cultural heritage to be appreciated. Uh, and I, I, I'm a researcher at the university and I'm writing on the transmission of the Farish chain dance, so I was very interested in this debate and I followed the debate in the parliament. And it was very clear that there were a lot of good intentions and the sense of urgent need to safeguard important heritage. But I think uh, it's not just in the Faroe Islands, there's very many places where people discuss these things, but the discussion were very diffuse and going into various directions and mixing all kinds of matters without a clear vision of what the purpose and function of this tool was. <laughs> so it's like 
I have this feeling that we're getting this really smart gadget. Everybody was really happy. It was on the news last year that uh, we finally passed this convention in the last uh, Nordic country. Uh, but it's a very, very complex manual, and there's just one person who's really had time to look into the manual, that's Armgar, and she <laughs> couldn't make it <laughs> today. But uh, it's, she's the one responsible for a sort of coordinating uh, the entire thing. But uh, what uh, she asked, also asked me to say is that, we, of course, we have been working with intangible heritage in the Faroes also before this convention started. Uh, so, um, in the case of the Ferris chain dance, if we go back to that slide. Uh, yeah, I can also say that we're also included in that submission of the clinker boats because we also, we, ha we have, ju we just started to do the Ferris inventory and there's currently just the boat building uh, skills is on that list. And uh, the chain dance will be next, I think. Uh, so, this example of the Ferris chain dance, uh, it has actually been part of public education since 97. It's been a mandatory subject in the public schools since 97. Um, and in different levels in our educational system, uh, it, the, the dance and the ballad tradition is taught. Um, but I ha will have to say that there has been a focus on the ballads as literature, not so much on the living dance. And that's been, that has been a complaint from the dancing organizations, which have found that uh, the recruiting of dancing has been really challenging. They have been seeing a, a decline of interest in the dance. So they really wanted uh, the schools to do more about uh, engaging pupils in dance. But since 97, the dance has actually been a mandatory subject. Um, yeah, the time is very short, but I can just say, uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, that the, the dance is uh, included in the public schools. That's where, that's where they um, try to transmit the dance as a living tra tradition by doing the dance with the children, sp specifically between Christmas and Lent, which is the traditional dancing season. That's when they very often will work uh, with the ballads. They will learn one or two short ballads and then they will gather together. Like that picture is from one event at one of the public schools where they have dressed up for the Fastolavent, the, the Lent uh, celebration and they do this chain dance uh, together. Uh, whereas when you go up in um, the higher grades and uh, to secondary school, it's more a theoretical thing about the ballads and analyzing the ballads as texts. And then at the university where I myself teach oral tradition, uh, ballads are taught as part, part of the, the history of literature. So it's just a very minor subject. And, uh, and then you can also have it as part of your graduate studies. Like I'm doing my PhD on the, the dance at the moment and I know some other people are worried about ballads. Yeah. Thank you, Tota. <laughs> uh, that time is that much and I will now invite my colleague, Aura Seikula from the Arts Promotion Finland to the stage. And I would kindly like you to ask you all to grab your wheel chart of sustainable development. Aura will come and say something about it. Yeah, can you hear me? Maybe can you just move this? Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, hello everyone. As you arrived, uh, I believe many of you took this uh, wonderful, exciting wheel. And um, it, this is actually a moment for us also to make a proper launch and pilot to this wheel chart. We are going to be working on it. Many of you will be joining us on Saturday uh, at the World Saving Clinic, where this tool will be really activated. But for those of you who won't be able to join us, I will just really shortly tell the way it works so that you can also take it with you and um, activate it in your own professional and social domain. So um, it, it is a social discussion and social innovation tool. It is, um, it is actually built on the four pillars of sustainability. This wheel chart is really um, aimed to activate those regular ideas of these four pillars, uh, ecological, economic, social, and cultural sustainability. And if you look at the wheel, um, these four pillars are actually divided in all in two categories. If we look at first uh, the ecological sustainability, um, those categories are ecology and nature. For economic categories, uh, we have economic equity and role of economics. For social sustainability, it's accessibility and interaction. And then for cultural sustainability, continuity and ownership. 
And it's very exciting to actually uh, activate this tool, uh, especially in, in this in intangible cultural heritage context, as we, we do believe, and this is actually the starting point for the for uh, implementing this uh, wheel chart for sustainability, as we believe that intangible cultural heritage actually entails this possibility for social change. So we hope that you will be activated um, wherever you work, whoever you work with, or what is the practice that you share with others. Um, and yeah, for those who can join us on Saturday, we'll be doing some more. And yes, um, we will be providing this tool in different languages. Um, currently, it is accessible in Finnish online at ajankohtaista. Exactly. Or news or aktuella. So if you take my brochure or our brochure from upstairs and you go to the news section, you will find it there. But we will also send the link to all the participants exactly. and data to be shared. Exactly. That's all from my partner. Thank you, Aura. So I think this is now the point where I can say thank you, kiitos tak, to all my colleagues, and you can have your round of applause. <laughs> Aura, was that two minutes you were showing that? Okay, uh, my question is how many minutes can we have for the questions or comments from the audience, like five-ish. Okay, Pirjo, if you will help with the, what's it called, and I will open the floor for questions or comments. Uh, you should throw it onwards, up. <laughs> <laughs> so s stay awake. <laughs> We will see if someone is sleeping. And what do I do with it? You take it and speak to it. Okay. Yeah. Great. Put it close yeah, to hello, your face. I'm uh, hi Maria. I'm Susie from Denmark. <laughs> I, um, first time we meet, actually. Um, I would like to um, that we we get some some. Um, we are Nordic countries. We have got somehow the same culture. I would so much like that, that we could find some common uh, tradition to work on uh, over our limits, our state limits. For instance, my, uh, my work with neighbors, which is actually a shortening of Scandinavians, which mean the wandering Scandinavian craftsmen, it's not only a Danish tradition, uh, but it is uh, about to die, and in, uh, for instance, Sweden, Norway, everywhere else in the Nordic country, you forgot about it. So I would so much uh, like that we could form a group or something and uh, get into this uh, in common and revitalize it. Yeah, and I have been thinking also of the clink boats, that's also a Danish tradition. Why not uh, get together and work on it together uh, as Nordic countries, yeah. Thank also, you. Also, yeah, Nordic singing, um, the Nordic tone, that's also for all of us. It could be great if we could form groups and work together uh, as Nordic countries. Thank you, Susie, for the comment. So I think both the Nordic Baltic workshop is for you and then maybe also, I don't know, even UNESCO nominations, but thanks for sharing the idea. Some other questions or comments? There was a hand somewhere. I know this is the disturbing moment when you have many questions, but then they suddenly disappear somewhere. There is one. Okay. Okay. Hello. <coughs> my name is Verika. Uh, uh, here I'm representing uh, UN Migration Agency, but also Uppsala University since I'm doing postdoctorate in intangible cultural heritage. I'm very... Uh, Honored to be here, and thank you very much for uh, organizers. They provided me with the facilitation to take part. I have two questions. First question is related to UN Special Rapporteur for Cultural Rights, and I'm wondering if some of you, or in your countries, did you use these resources for uh, preserving or for addressing uh, dying uh, traditions or uh, 
some um, culture, traditions, intangible cultural heritage resources at the risks. And the second uh, question is related to migration. Since uh, in the last years we are uh, witnessing a crisis related to integration of migrants and uh, in Nordic uh, region of Europe we have quite a lot of refugees, migrants, uh, not only labor migrants but also uh, refugees especially. How do you think uh, your organizations, ministries, responsible institutions dealing uh, and tackling with this question? Do you have any updates on that or is not yet. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the important question. I think some of our countries have been working with, with minorities and also with refugees to some extent. Uh, the question you asked on the UN human rights, uh, what was the word again? I don't think the cooperation has been in that level, but mainly working with, for example, with the city of Helsinki, the International Cultural Center, Kaisa, or then with such associations, NGOs or museums who work especially with immigrants and refugees. And I know workshops have been organized at least here in Finland and I think also both in Norway and Sweden. I don't know about the other countries yet. Hilda Gunn or Annika, do you want to comment on, on something? So it's definitely needed and I think there are quite many countries maybe in the convention who see that this is some kind of a national traditional cultural heritage process, but it's definitely, as Suzanne said, that we are working with all kind of living heritage inside our borders, and I think we in the Nordic countries have really seen it so that it is both the old and the, the new uh, majorities and minorities that need to be included in this process and are included. Okay, this will give me one or two minutes extra. <laughs> 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 because uh, I wanted to mention one case of cooperation which has di direct aim to involve the national minorities in the work in Sweden. And in from the institute, ISOF, we started in 2017 a new project with the aim of making the Roma, the different Roma intangible cultural heritage visible and spread information about the convention in the Roma group. The project resulted in several proposals to the national inventory. For instance, about music and dance, storytelling, traditions, and handicraft. This project is a pilot study, and we hope in the future that it also shall be applied to other national minorities in Sweden. So, this is one case. <laughs> thank you, a minute used well. I think we will now say thank you and leave the stage for the last number of this morning session. So, no. ah, a very quick question, yes. Yes, good uh, evening, my name is Ella Karin Blind and I represent the Sami National Association of the Sami people in Sweden. And uh, I want to say we are the indigenous people in the Scandinavia and that's what we want to be called. It's, it's our name, we are the Sami people. And it's also important for all of you to recognize that we have our own culture, our uh, own handicraft, our reindeer herding and uh, don't forget about it. We are mm. here and we will be here during the whole conference. So we were, we're open to talk to all of you. We are a group of Sami people here. Thank you. Thank you, Ella Karin. So thank you, dear colleagues. Sorry we had just one hour, not two, but next time maybe two hours. So thank you.